Okay, thank you very much. Thanks to the uh, organizers as well for inviting me. I'll share my screen and I assume that you uh, know and that uh, if, you, if you can't, just let me know. Yeah, so thanks to uh, the organizers, as I say. Also, uh, I think my presentation uh, will, will probably connect Paul Fletcher said yesterday about uh, embedded constraints. And also, uh, perhaps uh, uh, it'll go back to Lisa Feldman Barrett's uh, talk where uh, the body had um, a role to play in predictive processing. So my question uh, is, is this. In prediction error minimization accounts, are bodily, ecological, uh, or environmental uh, factors irrelevant to explaining cognition? And uh, of course, I'm going to suggest that they're not. Um, but what motivates the question uh, is uh, Jakob Howey's, I, I think of it as a well-known uh, uh, statement, but that's maybe just because I, I quote it so often. Um, but Howey in his, uh, uh, his paper in 2016, the uh, PEM should make us resist conceptions of a mind-world relation on which the mind is in some fundamental way open or porous to the world, or on which it is in some strong sense embodied, extended, or inactive. Instead, PEM uh, reveals the mind to be inferentially secluded from the world. It seems to be more neurocentrically skull-bound than embodied or extended. And action itself is more an inferential process or sensory input than an, an active coupling with the world. So I think for Howie, the body uh, at best uh, plays something like the, the role of sensory information source. Uh, in, uh, it, it enters into a process uh, where descending predictions from the brain are, are compared with ascending uh, predictions uh, uh, and prediction errors uh, from the periphery. Um, and and this, this idea of descending and ascending information streams, that, that plays an important part in the PEM explanation. Um, I'm going to, uh, you know, my, my target really is, is, uh, is Hoey uh, and, and this statement that he makes about embodied and embedded and, uh, and, and so forth um, types of accounts. What I want to uh, do is I want to use the example of uh, perceptual illusions. Uh, and I think perceptual illusions present uh, problems for PEM accounts um, that are based on uh, something we could call uh, the, the short circuiting of the information flow. Um, the, the solution that they propose is, is in terms of this kind of short circuiting idea. So the short circuiting idea is, is the idea that where there are general statistical regularities in the environment, relevant priors are related to lower level processing so that information from higher levels is not exchanged uh, or is not as precise as it should be. Okay, so here is um, an outline of what I'll try to get through. Um, I'll start with a kind of broad characterization of what I call the free trade of information principle. I'll go into some problems uh, that I think uh, uh, can be found in the explanation of perceptual illusions. And then uh, in the end, I'll try to outline uh, kind of broader, more inactive uh, architecture. So first, this uh, free trade of information principle. 
According to the PEM, uh, PEM uh, explanation, top-down and bottom-up exchanges of information uh, across a hierarchical structure help the system to efficiently minimize prediction errors. So this, I think, is a, a familiar story to, uh, to you all. Uh, and I, I don't, I'm not going to rehearse it. You know, it involves priors and generative models and predictive uh, hypotheses. Um, here, for example, is how, how he describes it. Predictions are sent down where they attenuate as well as possible the input. Parts of the input uh, it cannot attenuate are allowed to progress upwards as prediction errors. Or again, he says, hypotheses are tested by passing messages, predictions and prediction errors up and down in the hierarchy. Okay, so um, the, the flow of information up and down, of course, is, uh, is not always straightforward. There's some complexity involved in this. The process is iterative. There are inputs uh, at each stage that change as informational states uh, change at adjacent stages. Um, and as Orlandi and uh, Lee put it, uh, these changes will mandate new updates. Also, sensory modalities, uh, different sensory modalities will provide multiple insulated streams of information acting as evidence for prediction confirmation and allowing for uh, an increase in precision. Uh, this is a, an important uh, idea that Howie emphasizes quite a bit. Uh, he says, within the brain, the evidence delivered by different senses is integrated at a higher level in an optimal Bayesian manner. The integrated estimate is more reliable than either individual estimate, than either of the individual estimates. Uh, it is best to rely on multiple sources of reasonably reliable sensory evidence from uh, within the brain. Okay. So the, the problem uh, of perceptual illusion. So I'm sure you're familiar with these illusions. Uh, there's a number of perceptual, um, both visual and proprioceptive illusions um, that I think uh, present problems for the PEM accounts. Um, so an example is the Mueller liar illusion, uh, where two lines are perceived as having different lengths, despite the fact that they are equal. The perceptual experience persists even when we know that the two lines are of equal length. So in spite of the free, uh, the free trade of information principle, where top-down and bottom-up exchanges are said to minimize prediction errors, perceptual illusions seemingly allow prediction errors uh, to, to rule. And even if our top-down uh, priors include reliable and secure knowledge that the lines in the Euler liar illusion are equal, the system seems unable to correct the sensory errors that form the illusion. Well, um, the classical explanation of this, uh, you know, is put in terms of, of uh, cognitive in impenetrability, where, for example, sensory processes are considered to be modular and informationally encapsulated. Uh, so they, uh, they provide input into the system, but they don't receive input from central cognitive uh, processes. The modules are kind of cut off from the central processes. Well, this uh, would then be a denial of the free trade of information principle. Sensory modules block or filter out uh, any information that would be coming top down from processes based on wider uh, belief or or knowledge. In contrast, I think for PEM, the free trade of information should mean that the knowledge gained from our prior experience with the illusion or from being informed about it will correct our perception and we should be able to see that the lines are equal. Now, 
nonetheless, of course, they continue to appear as unequal. We can even employ active inference. Uh, we can measure the lines and adjust our hypothesis, which should then correct the prediction errors found in our sensory experience, but this also uh, fails. Likewise, the rubber hand illusion. Um, with that illusion, my model of the world, and thereby my prediction, is that this rubber hand is not part of my body, but we seem unable to eliminate the, the prediction errors coming from the combined tactile visual stimulus. And in the rubber hand illusion, of course, we have sensory conflict. The, the visual input dominates the proprioceptive sense of where my hand uh, is located. This sensory conflict is not a bad thing. Uh, in fact, it should, it should motivate integration at a higher level and allow uh, for a gain in precision. But we also need to allow for some flexibility. Situations call for flexibility. Gilvey and, uh, and Carruthers say vision needs to be flexible uh, in the way that it deals with uh, variations in, in context. So there are circumstances uh, in which uh, it may be beneficial to, to allow priors to dominate and ignore prediction errors. Andy Clark, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, has this example where uh, you're driving on a foggy uh, but familiar road, uh, and you should probably rely on prior knowledge about how such conditions can affect your perception. And on the other side, uh, or on the contrary, uh, driving on an unfamiliar mountain road uh, with sharp curves, uh, it would be wise to trust uh, your you know, finely attuned senses um, uh, on what they're telling you, uh, and, and even if that doesn't match with your expectations. Um, so this is a matter really of adjusting the precision weights of specific hypotheses since, as Andy puts it, the precise mix of top-down and bottom-up influence is not static or fixed. Instead, the weight given to sensory prediction error is varied according to how reliable, how noisy, certain or uncertain the signal is taken to be. So this kind of uh, flexibility uh, is, uh, uh, well, if it modulates the exchange of information uh, based on reliability parameters, it, it still doesn't block the exchange entirely. Uh, and it, it really can't explain the persistence of, of illusions, the fact that they are, are you know, still operative, even though we know that they should not be. Um, so if perception or if the system is epistemically flexible, why do the relevant adjustments fail to occur in such cases, um, at least in the long term? Why don't perception and cognition engage in effective exchange in order to minimize error? In light of the free trade of information principle, as Ogilvy and, and uh, Carruthers put it, it might seem mysterious why one's uh, belief should fail to modify the erroneous perceptual representation. Or going the other way, uh, why don't prediction errors result in the revision of the higher level model? Uh, maybe the, the rubber hand is part of my body. Uh, well, that, that seems to be, at least the way I read it, uh, the solution uh, to this type of thing proposed by Anamala Gomez and, and colleagues in, in a recent paper. Um, I'm not going to sort of go through uh, this, but where they kind of end up is uh, sort of with the idea that, well, we, uh, we, we should end up believing that the rubber hand is uh, part of our body. And of course, that doesn't really uh, make a lot of sense. The proposed PEM solution doesn't end up there. Uh, but rather, uh, it relies on the idea of this short circuiting by relevant priors operating at lower levels 
so that uh, prediction errors are blocked from reaching the higher levels of the system. So here again is uh, Ogilvy and, and Carruthers. We suggest that something like this occurs when the visual system is processing depth and size information while one looks at a Mueller Lyer figure. As far as the early levels of processing are concerned, relative depth and size have been accurately calculated from unambiguous cues. Hence, systems monitoring uh, noise and error levels are being told that everything is in order. There's no need for further processing. Okay, the, the lack of ascending prediction errors still counts as information for the higher levels, uh, namely the, the absence of, a, of an error signal uh, uh, would, would, would uh, be telling the, the, uh, the, higher, uh, the higher levels um, that uh, there's, there is no contradiction, despite the fact that there is uh, seemingly a contradiction in the system. Uh, it would be saying things are as expected, uh, but in fact, you know, we still have this contradiction. So this resolution of the mystery, I think, is not convincing. Not only because the contradiction remains, uh, but uh, also because uh, it relies on the idea uh, that the, the perceptual illusion is ambiguous. Uh, oh, sorry, is not ambiguous, right? Um, I, I think there is ambiguity there myself. Um, and, and indeed, shouldn't one think uh, that if perceptual illusions are unambiguous, then most other instances of perception should also be unambiguous. But in that case, there, never, there would never be a, like a call uh, for higher level PEM. As uh, Ogilvy and Carruthers propose here, uh, since when sensory input is sufficiently unambiguous, the higher level priors don't need to come into play. So is it really the case that in perceptual illusions, our, our perceptions remain unambiguous? Well, first, I think, uh, given what we know, for example, that the lines are the same length in the Mueller liar illusion, or that the hand that I see is not my hand, as in the rubber hand illusion, uh, then there's no reason to think that this knowledge uh, shouldn't come into conflict with the sensory cues. And then second, um, and this may be a lot clearer in the rubber hand illusion, the perceptual ambiguity can be measured in terms of how surprising or unexpected the experience is. If you ever tried the rubber hand uh, uh, experiment, uh, well, you know that it's not your hand, but it, it nonetheless feels like your hand. So uh, there's a kind of surprise here. Um, and it, it seems to me that the PEM short circuit story denies that, that ambiguity, tries to explain it away, when in fact, the overarching model that PEM, PEM is, is, uh, is following, um, would say that prior knowledge and sensory cues should be talking to one another, communicating, passing messages, trading in information. Um, and that should predict the ambiguity that, that, that we do experience in these illusions. So the proposed PEM solution relies on the idea of a short circuiting by relevant priors operating at lower levels so that prediction errors are blocked from reaching higher levels of the system. I think, uh, yeah, I think I just went backwards, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, Howie, I think, recognizes the, 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 the challenge here uh, as he considers the mueller liar illusion. Uh, he says, even if we have a strong prior belief that they are of equal lengths, we still perceive it to be, uh, perceive one to be longer. So the conscious experience here seems impenetrable. 
a higher level belief fails to modulate perception, what can prediction error uh, minimization, minimization uh, say about this? Um, now, although I think uh, Howie, in contrast to Ogilvy and Carruthers, affirms that the illusion provides viewers with what he calls an ambiguous input, almost immediately this ambiguity gets resolved uh, at the perceptual level because he says the context provided by the wings on the Mueller liar lines triggers fairly low level priors leading to the inference that they are of different lengths rather than to the competing inference that they are of the same length. In other words, the uh, ambiguity is eliminated early in the visual processing of a, of a low level PEM where he says the relevant priors occupy levels of the hierarchy within the early visual system itself. Okay. Still, one wonders, uh, along with, with Howie himself, why the higher level prior belief in equal lengths cannot penetrate and create veridical experience of the lengths, or why the higher level prior belief does not correct the lower order uh, prior or vice versa? And the answer, uh, according to Howie, he says the consequence of the early resolution to the ambiguity is that very little residual prediction error is shunted upwards in the system, and that therefore there is little work for any higher level prior beliefs to do, including the true belief that the lines are of equal length. So if there is ambiguity in the initial sensory input, the system short circuits it so that it never triggers um, higher order priors. The question is never raised through the hierarchy to the level of the more general predictive model. Okay, so in the case of the, the rubber hand illusion, uh, Howie suggests that the brain needs to determine which of two hypotheses is the most pro probable. First, that the visual of the rubber hand is independent uh, from the tactile situation of the real hand. Or second, that there is a, a binding of the visual and the tactile and that you're experiencing the touch where you see it uh, administered in, uh, uh, on, the, on the rubber hand. So how he contends that the, the synchronicity is important here and uh, yeah, it's more expected on the binding hypothesis than on the independence hypothesis. And this is what leads to the illusion. So here the winning hypothesis is apparently on a higher level than the immediate sensory processes, but not high up enough to encounter a more certain hypothesis, which must also be represented in the brain, namely that the rubber hand is not really part of my body or that the experimenter, is, uh, as Gatsby and Howie put it, the experimenter is the hidden cause of both the seen touch and the unseen touch on the real hand. One could also think of this in terms of intersensory precision and what happens proprioceptively. I remember Howie made an important point about uh, the competing uh, uh, sensory modalities and, and how that gains you uh, precision. I just want to point to, you know, out in this, in this kind of longish quote, um, where he, he points to experimental design as somehow or other important here. By experimental design, he says, I'm unable to elicit, uh, elicit precise information about the position of my arm because I cannot move it. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that um, at, at uh, some point. Still, it's not clear why the question is not raised in a more circuitous way since uh, at a personal level, we know that the lines are in fact equal and that the rubber hand is not part of our body. So it's not clear why this particular situation is not one in which the system realizes, as how he puts it, you cannot trust the signal from the world, but must arrive at a conclusion 
so you rely on prior knowledge. In the, the rubber hand uh, illusion, Howey suggests that uh, rather than complying with prior conceptual belief, there is a supposition of prediction uh, errors. The system doesn't eliminate uh, them, it, it ignores them. Uh, not supposition, but suppression, sorry, of, of prediction errors. It is as if, he says, the perceptual system would rather explain away precise sensory input with a conceptually implausible model. This rubber hand is part of my body. Uh, it would rather do that than leave some precise sensory evidence, for example, the synchrony unexplained. This still does not explain why our more plausible knowledge that the rubber hand is not part of my body uh, fails to correct uh, the experience. The, the most plausible model should have some kind of role to play in this. And uh, as Gatsby and Howie put it, when prediction error has low precision, uh, priors hold more relative weight and are thus given greater influence in sculpting the relevant perceptual representation or shape or, or policies uh, selected. So in the case of the rubber hand illusion, you might think that the experimentally imposed inability to move or the weak uh, proprioceptive signal generating uh, an imbalance in multi-sensory integration uh, or what they call a Q ambiguity, uh, when uh, the contingent tac uh, visual tactile signal uh, uh, conflict with proprioception. Um, you, you would think that that might be a measure of low sensory pre precision and would motivate a search for a higher order resolution. This is you know, precisely what, what Howie is saying here, uh, you know, when when, when, uh, when the sensory input has low precision, uh, then we should be looking upstairs uh, on the hierarchy uh, to find resolution. Okay, so uh, the last part of this is about a broader and active architecture. Um, so of course, the, the free trade of information uh, principle is a, a kind of piece of ideal theory that in reality is not so free trade because there is complexity in the system, there's flexibility requirements and, and so forth. And even a, a further complication that Howie thinks helps to explain the short circuiting, uh, really it's down to brain architecture, he says. Uh, and this is also connected with the sensory differences in the integration at higher levels. Uh, he writes, Bayes optical uh, integration can be compromised. Conditional independence of the sensory streams uh, within the brain is made possible by the brain's organic structure, preventing information flow across processing streams in lower parts of the cortical hierarchy. Uh, in neuroscience, this is uh, known as functional segregation. So, there are diff these differences in lateral insulation, a kind of horizontal evidential insulation, he calls it, operating at different levels. Meant to provide a gain in precision at the higher level, uh, derived from a mix of multiple sources of reasonably reliable sensory evidence from within the brain, as he had put it. And the result is a kind of, con of cognitive penetrability and impenetrability. Um, again, this, uh, this, uh, this is part of the, the, the solution that he, he wants to give, uh, and uh, well, architecture simply imposes limits on top-down and lateral modulation. Um, it's not a free-for-all situation, and therefore that principle is, is not entirely uh, uh, uncomplicated. Uh, but it's, it's difficult to see how I think uh, organic structure or aspects of the organic structure of the brain uh, is going to be able to explain of perceptual illusion in contrast 
or perception. Since, well, these structures are uh, supposed to be stable um, and they would remain the same, I would think, for both kinds of perceptual experience. And usually the, the work is being done by inferential processes, representational models, prediction errors, semantic content of the messages that are being passed up and down. Um, these are the things that change or adjust uh, and provide the explanation more so than organic structures. Um, and again, you would think that organic structures are going to stay relatively the same, even, even if you allow for plasticity, um, they, they stay relatively the same, uh, constraining processes in both non-illusory and, and illusory. So I think that's, that's, that's a problem. How he sometimes, however, obliquely points to other factors, although these don't really become part of his systematic explanation of perception. Uh, and in fact, I think that these other factors that he points to would in a certain way undermine his internalistic uh, account. In regard to the rubber hand illusion, for example, he reported that people are rather poor at using their prior belief to destroy the illusion. What we do get a lot in our lab is people who have an overwhelming urge to move their hands, remove the goggles, or otherwise intervene on the process. For example, one person we tested physically had to hold her hand fixed with her other hand to prevent it from moving. Likewise, with regard to the mueller liar illusion, he notes that what prevents our use of the veridical prior belief about the length of the two lines is the constraints of the situation. He, okay. We might try, he says, engaging the veridical prior belief, but fail because the situation is constrained. None of our predictions can get traction on the decontextualized line drawings in a proper controlled experimental setup. Indeed, the non-ecological aspects of the experimental environment is something that he is consistently noting uh, in the context of his discussion of perceptual illusions. He really is uh, pointing to uh, circumstances uh, in the world, so to speak, uh, as part of what, uh, what is going uh, on here. These uh, other factors then, uh, I think involve a broader architecture that at the, uh, the same time would not deny the important considerations about uh, the organic structure of the brain. So I don't want to say, you know, that the organic structure of the brain has nothing to do with it. Uh, so I, the brain is in fact uh, important. That's my timer, okay. Uh, the brain is important here. Um, but I think we should acknowledge that the brain and the body evolve and, and develop together and that the brain has the material structure that it does have um, and it works the way it, it works uh, because it has evolved with the body. So in other words, uh, I, I want to argue that cognition and perception are in some strong sense embodied, uh, extended and inactive, rather than inferentially secluded from the world or neurocentrically um, skull-bound, as you know, in the words of, of uh, Jakob Howey. So I want to look, uh, you know, at these environmental factors and circumstances. And I think what they, what happens is that they introduce a, a kind of structural uh, resistance, uh, which is connected, uh, I think, to, to Paul's embedded constraints in some, in some fashion. But you know, if, if it is the environmental factors and circumstances that Howie's pointing to, uh, in that case, it's not 
brain architecture or just brain architecture or uh, a conditional independence of different sensory systems or a conceptually implausible uh, model or an, uh, an ignoring of prediction errors uh, that, that is doing the work. It's the environment, which includes uh, the precision regularities of the world. And it's the non-ecological circumstances that, that place constraints on the system and prevent the agent from taking action. In contrast, when subjects are allowed to move and act, at least in some cases, they can adapt to visual illusions relatively rapidly in some cases. And such adaptations, uh, depending upon the size and location of the relevant objects, um, are again due uh, to environmental uh, circumstances. With respect to uh, perceptual illusions, one way to put it is that the effect is in the brain-body environment coupling rather than exclusively in brain circuitry. For example, something as simple and as complex as arm position can have an effect on the rubber hand illusion. So the effect is modulated with mismatches in position and uh, it starts to disappear the further away from canonical uh, position that the, the arm is in. And indeed, uh, Howey himself, I think, shows that it is wrong to downplay the role of embodiment in the rubber hand illusion uh, in his own lab uh, where he's using uh, virtual reality goggles. He says, if there's no distance between the real and the rubber hand, for example, if a virtual reality goggle is used to create spatial overlap between the real and the rubber hand, then the illusion is strengthened. And this spatial overlap is precisely an embodied phenomenon, the result of a specific arrangement of goggles, body, and environment. These kind of extra neural material arrangements can be exploited to increase or decrease the illusion. Likewise, uh, there are changes in the Mueller Lyer uh, illusion depending on the proportion of space taken up by the line between the, the wings. How, how we arrange these things will have an effect on the illusion. So the Mueller Lyer uh, illusion. And it covers around 70% of the space, and it reverses when the line covers around uh, 50. Uh, Michael Turvey uh, points out, in reference to the Mueller Lyer illusion, the perception of a thing, X, for example, a line, in one context may differ on principle from its perception in another context. The principal origin of the difference lies in the impredicative nature of the thing in context. And he suggests that encountering the reverse Miller Lyer illusion is just as probable as encountering the Mueller Lyer illusion in natural settings. And if that's the case, it's questionable whether we should bias that would simply short circuit perceptual processes. Um, yeah, so I think that I don't want to deny, for example, that uh, prior uh, uh, ex uh, experience uh, and perhaps uh, features of the sensory motor system um, that are derived from say developmental and evolutionary processes uh, could lead to mistaken predictions. Uh, but the reason why ongoing experience, which is supposed to, to shape or reshape priors in order to allow the system to learn, uh, to learn its way past the illusion, um, the reason that can't get traction is because of the material constraints imposed by both bodies and environments. Um, and I, I would add to that, uh, in fact, I would add cultural features as well. 
And there is some evidence that cultural differences can change the experience of the illusions, in some cases eliminating the illusion uh, altogether. Um, and I always like to point to this experiment by Solomon and Lindbergh. Uh, it's an experiment uh, about joint action and about working together in a synchronous way and changing one's experience of peripersonal space and changing one's, you know, they, call, they talk about a joint body schema. Uh, but, but then they, they test different populations from different cultures on it. Uh, and, and what they basically show is that cultural difference go all the way down into the body schematic processes. And so they conclude, uh, this is, so this is very fast, but they conclude culture enters the scene not as a self-contained layer on top of behavior, but as the sum of sensory motor knowledge brought about by a bodily agent interacting in a social and physical context. As such, culture diffuses the web of sensory motor knowledge and can only be arbitrarily circumscribed from other knowledge. So I think culture in some sense permeates these processes. So my conclusion then, the short, uh, the short circuit solution, uh, I think over discounts the reliable and secure knowledge that is in the system. Knowledge that I have at a personal level. Uh, but that also, that must also be according to PEM represented somewhere in the brain and it must have some kind of play in the process. In contrast to how he's downplaying of embodied, extended, or inactive factors. One needs to appeal to bodily and environmental factors, I think, to resolve these problems. So I think the alternative uh, is uh, a kind of 4E embodied, embedded, extended, and active solution that uh, emphasizes structural resistance involving even cultural factors in the broader cognitive uh, system. Uh, this is uh, something that I've argued uh, in, in, a, in a paper forthcoming, hopefully, uh, uh, with Dan Hutto uh, and Ines Hippolyte. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks to my co-authors and thanks to you for, uh, for listening.